Good afternoon to you all. I'm Victor Halberstadt. I'm the uh, moderator of this session, which is aptly titled The Great Contraction. Hi. I thought I was doing pretty well. Is this better? Yeah. Is this better? Good. I thought I had this wonderful opening sentence, which I wanted to mention to you that the title of this session, The Great Contraction, sounds a bit like the, the Great Train Robbery. Um, but in fact, what we are discussing here is a very major, major issue. Are we able to avoid a continuation of a deep recession? Are we able to prevent another financial crisis? For that, we have a very able panel, very experienced, very expert, uh, and very little introduction is required. Uh, on my left is Jumin of the IMF. Next to him is Bill Rhodes, Bill. who is the only one in this room probably who has published a book in the last two months, which I'm <laughs> pitching for you. Vincent <laughs> von Quickenborn, who is a, a Belgian minister, and it's interesting, he and I sat on a panel in Dalian a year ago, and he told me that Belgium was about to form a new government. And you know what? It still isn't there 12 months later. <laughs> Victor Chu, a entrepreneur from Hong Kong and a worldwide known person. And Mr. Singh, member of parliament <coughs> from India. All very expert. We will talk about everything, but we will do it very disciplined. We will talk about deleveraging, we will talk about policy tools, we will talk about volatility, we will talk about, I guess, about political costs of economic change, uh, and you will be able to say afterwards that you felt that the panel was either bullish or bearish. But we have only 60 minutes, so we will be very disciplined. Initially, each of the panelists will speak three or four minutes at the max, and we will try to have some Q&A with the room. Let me quickly say one thing about the framework of our situation. Question is, is there a second great contraction, contraction out there? That's the title of the session. Or, as I am inclined to think, did we never finish with the first great contraction that started four years ago in 2007, with the housing bubble in the United States? We had at that time nearly a decade of prosperity financed by debt. And now we need to pay this down. And obviously, that was never going to happen over the course of two years. And indeed, it didn't. And of course, there was lots of transfer of debt from the private sector, in fact, to the public sector. And all of that is now under serious scrutiny. In the meantime, there has been some temporary relief for some asset markets see what happened to equities over the past two years. But in fact, we are now in a situation in the Western world, in Europe and in the United States, a rather worrying situation, as some might say, where we have to place a large amount of faith in the ability and the uh, capacity of politicians to haul us out of the very difficult situation we are in. And the best I think we can hope for in the West is a slow grind out of that hole. Uh, now, if we look at this situation, which I have just very briefly summarized, it's of course, most of all, very important to understand where the world economy currently is. And there's no better guide on that than Zhu Min. Three minutes. <laughs> well, thank you, but you give me only three minutes, that will be very, very tough. The overall picture, uh, I would say, uh, since August, we say market is very much volatile. But within the volatile, what we saw is we saw global capital relocation. All this money move out the risky assets and move into the safe assets. So that's the reason the U.S. bonds market yields so low, 10-year bonds are lower 2% now. And all this risky uh, assets, the capital market, particularly banking sector, and also we see the capital outflow. But meanwhile, also, we see capital move out of the dollar assets because concerns about the further weakening of the dollar. So then we see the gold price increase. We see Frank, uh, 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 Swiss France, uh, France, and we see Japanese yuan further strength because people are looking for the HIV-7. And the commodity price is very volatile, more or less, and uh, stay in the high price. So this is a very volatile market. 
Uh, the question is obviously what will uh, 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 be the situation in the next say, few months in the futures. Underlying this huge volatility, there are a few concerns. The first concern is the weather, the European sovereign uh, crisis with expand continuing to the banking crisis. I think that's one key issue. Se second issue is whether the U.S. deficit crisis will further extend to slow down the U.S. economic growth and move into the double dip. And the third overall issue exactly concerns whether we'll move into uh, another big contraction. That means the deleveraging process will go further or stop. But I will say the current, if you're looking for S&P 500, it dropped 25% already. So actually it's a fully discounted market, the bad news already. But if you talk about the three concerns, all those concerns are still remaining there because people still concern the banking sector in Europe and the growth particularly slow down in the United States and the concern the balances are not very healthy, particularly in government se sector, in household sector, in banking sector, in some area, in corporate sector as well. Within all those concerns, I will say the market will be continuously very volatile in the near future. But, the, but it does not necessarily mean we're going into the uh, big contraction. It seems to me we have not or, or did not finish the first round of deleveraging. If you look, compare today with 2008, if you're looking for the advanced economy, the household balances are still very bad, still in very high level. In the financial sector, the balances are still very uh, high. Capital ratio is a little better, but the overall still weak. And if it, the further, if you compare today with uh, 2008, the government balances deteriorated dramatically. But the good news is the corporate sector balances, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's much better. So the currently further deleveraging, repair the balances, obviously, is a key issue for all the sectors of the world today. If we can do that, we'll be able to stop the, this is, uh, uh, financial uh, volatility and turmoil and uh, prevent further financial crisis. But we need a lot of policy actions. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Xiumin. Uh, it almost raises the question, which we can address later, whether volatility is the new norm. I mean, this enormous volatility. Right. We'll get to that a bit later. Uh, Vincent van Quickenborn, what is Europe going to do about this? Or what should it do about it? Well, I think that the current crisis today in Europe really shows us the, the structural flaws that there are to the foundations of the European Union. Um, Robert Mundell, a famous Nobel Prize winner of economy, once said the European Union is like should be like A, B, C. A with a monetary union, B a fiscal union, and C a political union. The problem is that we have the A, but we're missing the B and the C. And, and the main problem is that when, when we created a monetary union not so long ago, we set up agreements amongst member states on inflation, on debt, on deficits. And the first countries not to obey to, to those rules were the biggest countries of Europe. That was Germany, and that was France. And of course, it should not come as a surprise that on small countries like Greece and others do not respect neither the rules. What we've seen since 2008 is, in fact, we hobbled from short-term measures to other short-term measures. First, we tried to fix the problem in Greece. Then we tried to fix the problem in other countries. Then we set up a temporary structure. Now it has become the uh, Structural Fund, or European Financial Stability Facility. But uh, I do think that more of those short-term measures will not ease and calm the markets. So what we need are structural reforms. And the structural reforms is what we need is, uh, I can, it's, 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 the path is very clear. Either it's unity or it's divorce. And divorce of Europe will come at a huge risk. And that's like opening the Pandora's box. Unity, it me that means that we should start the beginning of what is called the Euro uh, uh, United States of Europe. And that holds two essential elements. First of all, create a market of euro bonds. That means that you create a global European bond market with attraction. And, and uh, 
the advantage of that system is that you lower the borrowing costs for member states, and secondly, you create a large market that even has an advantage to the United States, because we, in the Eurozone, when you compare it to the T-bonds, we uh, have a, um, a debt of about 85%, whereas the States is close to the 100%. And our deficit in Europe is close to 4%, where in the States it's 9%. So I think then you create a market, a huge market. You should combine that with a second element. And that is an element that has been proposed by the Dutch people. That is the creation, or by Mr. Trichet from the ECB, that's the creation of what we call a European Minister of Finance. That somebody, a person, an institution, that is able to intervene in an individual country when it's not willing to obey to the rules. Instead, that means, in fact, that you uh, take sovereignty out of that country and that you replace it by that uh, institution. So these two elements will lead us to a structural solution for the problems that we have. Of course, that in, means in that between, in between, Vincent, this sounds fine. I mean, for some people, this is apple pie and motherhood. You can't be against it. But it's not going to happen overnight. No. It will take many years. So what, do, what, what are the policy actions required now? Of course, on the short term, the biggest problem at the moment are two problems. First of all, Greece. And there, you have to find a solution. And uh, some people, I, I think, too easily talk about just default, structured default, unstructured default. I think this would be a, a, a led to lead to a, a huge crisis in Europe because there's always the risk of contagion. And if, you, if Greece goes into a default, structured or not structured default, immediately you look at other countries. So this is very riskful to, to think so. So I hope that the IMF with the Troika, with the European Union, when it comes back, it goes back to, to Greece, finds a, a solution because that is what we need. Uh, secondly, I think there is, of course, the, the banking crisis. The banking crisis in Europe today is different from that one in 2008. It has to do with the, with the, uh, the fact that uh, all those countries, the PICS countries, so-called PICS countries, Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Greece, and Spain, uh, we need to uh, control the, that contamination uh, so that we could uh, help. But I think it's a problem of individual banks, and you cannot say that the whole European banking system is, uh, uh, is, 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 is it, um, attacked by that. So on the long term, that these, are, these are the solutions, Victor, but yeah. we need to take the steps for them as soon as possible. On the short term, of course, looking at Greece and trying to control uh, the problem with Greece. But a default is not an option, because uh, if you default a country, the country has to leave the, Europe, uh, the Eurozone, and then it has to leave uh, the European Union. That's what uh, uh, an investment bank uh, said lately, and I do think that this uh, uh, leads to an enormous problem. Thank you, uh, Vincent. Uh, I turn to uh, the Indian Member of Parliament, Mr. Singh. Uh, now, all of this, you know, these discussions in the United States about debt, debt ceiling, government expenditure, and in Europe about the Eurozone, and these discussions about uh, contraction do sound a bit alien, I guess, to someone sitting in parliament in India, because you have a booming economy, and you have none of these problems. Are you worried about the contagion? Well, you know, I think that uh, it would be somewhat of an exaggeration to say that uh, we are happily sitting with uh, high rates of growth. Our rates have also tended to play, plateau off. We had a very animated discussion in parliament on whether emerging markets in general and some large Asian countries can escape the consequences of the European contagion, particularly when you begin to see a multiplicity and not necessarily a coherence of global prescriptions on the broader issue of uh, inflation versus growth, on the issues of whether uh, growth should be investment-led or consumption-led on what kind of growth policies will not lead to job jobless growth, on the question of fiscal rectitude coming in earlier than later and uh, before demand gets stifled. So I think with all this conflicting kind of prescriptions which are now being made available to us, we see that emerging markets would face typically four kinds of problems. The first, of course, is clearly access to global capital 
and the cost of the access to global capital, whether that would get seriously compromised for sustaining a high rates of growth. Second, how would exports behave in an environment where there's a growing fear of protectionism, uh, raising issues, for instance, of outsourcing, even though that may be the most efficient way in which economic uh, benefits are going to be optimized. Third, I think, how is one to handle exchange rate volatility? Should one allow exchange rates in emerging markets to go up and down as exchange rates become more and more volatile? And what are the consequences in terms of some medium-term planning, particularly for exports? And finally, how does one begin to learn a lesson from what is happening in the rest of the world in regard to part of the world saying, go in for fiscal rectitude now, because you may have a problem later. How does one balance the short term with the medium term? When I say all this, I think as we plan for the next five years, trying to achieve what we achieved in the last five years, namely an average rate of growth of around 8% of GDP, how do we sustain this while trying to balance these four asymmetries which uh, Victor I, I, I mentioned. We recognize that perhaps these uncertainties are the new normalcy with which emerging markets will have to live with, but certainly we would need to reconcile not only from the viewpoint of, of sustaining our high rates of growth which you have achieved, but being contributor to a global solution and not adding to that problem. Thank you, Mr. Singh. Uh, Victor Chu, the real economy, that's where you live, right? Yes, I think uh, last year uh, at the Summer Davos meeting in Tianjin, uh, I was asked whether it was the beginning of the end of the financial crisis or whether it was the end of the beginning. And I, of course, we now know, know the answer. I mean, the, the crisis never uh, went away. It's just getting more complex as we, as we proceed. Um, I think it is common ground that the next um, two or three years will be extremely challenging. But I would like to suggest that as a business, as entrepreneurs, we should look ahead to the, new, to the next cycle. The silver lining is that um, we will be taking a lot of painful medicine in the next two or three years, but institutions, banks, uh, regulatory infrastructure will be leaner and, uh, and stronger. And um, indeed, big companies, um, are still very liquid. Um, we had a survey at the recent International Business Council meeting. Most of us are, are still looking for growth, and uh, most of us are not looking to cut uh, costs in any, any major way. So big companies, I think, are still uh, very much uh, uh, okay. Where it will be hurt very badly is uh, SMEs around uh, the world. And I think here, uh, in terms of policy, uh, uh, options. We have to ensure that the new regulatory uh, uh, changes will really make sure the SME can survive um, in terms of classification of assets, loan to SMEs uh, could be given more favorable uh, treatment. But also, um, in terms of uh, European and American SMEs, Asia is still growing despite all the difficulties in India, in China, and rest of South Southeast Asia. So if uh, one is uh, an SME with a good track record, with a good product or good service. One should always really look out to Asia for, for growth, for defensive reasons. But obviously, being an SME, reaching out by yourself uh, will be difficult because uh, emerging markets, including uh, India and China, uh, could be a difficult market to crack if you're a small company. So one would have to look for good partners. And Provided one can look for partners and create the right synergy, I think it could be win-win. The growing market, middle-class market in China and India will require better services, different products in a new cycle of wealth creation. And that's where some of the European SMEs and American SMEs can ideally provide. And um, I think the, uh, the other point I'd like to make is, despite all the difficulty, we have to make sure that the discussions on the multilateral trading system have not been forgotten. Because that is the, is the easiest thing to, for, to, to forget. And we have to remember that so far, the WTO system is the, the fairest, the most non-discriminatory um, you know, for uh, countries around the world, the most democratic um, uh, 
uh, I would say. So I think we have to make sure that there could be new momentum being injected in those discussions. And finally, of course, the difficulty that we have today is really the difficulty in politics, the lack of political leadership, and also the political process in, in the West, which makes it very difficult to bite the bullet to make strategic uh, decisions. And I hope with the difficulty that we have now, um, ordinary people will lose um, patience to the impulse in the political process. People wake up philosophically that we have to sacrifice in order to maintain the long-term survival of our economy. And that sentiment can be reflected on the, onto the political circles to allow the political leaders to make the necessary strategic decision, however painful they may be. Thank you, Victor. Um, any advice for the Europeans? For me? Oh, yeah. yeah. I think the um, uh, I think we have to, we have to go back to, to to basics. We have to we have to believe that prudence, budget, and financial management is the only way to to, to go. And given time, we will we will get back. But without a prudence in budgetary and fiscal management, um, we we are only going down a slow path for for even even worse problems to come. Yeah, sure. Sure. You know, the, the, the job for the fund I just gave other people advices. So I just cannot help give our European friends some advices. I absolutely agree with you. You know, you see the long-term structure change is important for Europe. But the short-term, I also agree with you, the banking crisis or potential crisis is the most urgent issues I think a European facing today. So I would say key issue, as I mentioned today, if we're looking for the European financial crisis, is really to prevent the solvent uh, risk contagion to the banking crisis. So at this particular moment, the banking recapitalization and to make sure the banking sector stays solvent and stable is absolutely important for today. So European politicians have to make decisive policy to make sure the banking sector and stay sound and stable. I will say this is the most important issue today for European financial sector. Thank you. Um, we will talk about Europe in a moment again. While we are sitting here, uh, actually just before we came in, uh, major European banks were downgraded by the rating agencies. Uh, three, actually two large uh, uh, French banks and a third on watch. Uh, and when we leave this session, I think about that time, uh, two leaders uh, of major European countries, uh, Mrs. Merkel and uh, President Sarkozy, will have a, uh, a conversation over the phone, which for one reason or the other has been announced so that we all know that they're going to have a phone call. Um, that suggests that there is a major uh, set of uh, threats uh, uh, very nearby <coughs> relating to uh, the banking sector, and we, there's no better person to comment on that, actually, than Bill Rhodes, who, who published a book, as I already mentioned before, and he dealt with all the crises in our lifetime. But this one, you haven't touched on. You didn't even predict it, Bill. Well, I did a postscript in my book, which came out a couple of months ago, and I basically put forth five points that I tried to uh, convince my friends in Europe in Brussels, the various politicians, the central bankers and the commercial bankers that they ought to take a look at because the emerging markets in Latin America and Asia in the 80s and 90s went through uh, a series of debt crises and uh, they've turned around their economies and they learned the hard way. Unfortunately, the Europeans said, well, we're different, you know, we're mature economies, we're not emerging market economies, so we don't have to do these. And what they were is, first of all, contagion. This is a word that nobody remembered in Europe, but we learned to live with it in Latin America, and we saw it in Asia. And uh, this was, uh, I think, a point that the Europeans didn't want to recognize when Greece first got into trouble, which was in December 09. It was already into trouble, but it was first announced in December 09 uh, by Papandreou when he took office, the prime minister of Greece. And uh, 
uh, the Europeans didn't want to see that there could be contagion. Well, what do we have now? We have Greece, Ireland, Portugal, and we have the European Central Bank uh, intervening in those markets, but also buying bonds of uh, Spain and Italy, the third and fourth largest uh, economies. I think second of all <clears throat> is, the, uh, is the question of leadership. Uh, and, and we've seen that lacking because the politicians in Europe are bickering, arguing with each other all over the place in the sense of what they're going to do. And by the way, that telephone call is not only going to be Sarkozy and Merkel. It's supposed to include Prime Minister Papandreou, and they're supposed to come out with a statement on Greece. Now, when I walked in the room, I hadn't seen the statement. I don't think you had either, Victor, so I don't know what that statement's going to be. But I think another particular area which is very, very important in all of these crises, and I think uh, uh, my colleague Jumin just uh, commented on it, which relates to timing. You only have so much time to work out a crisis or it becomes uncontrollable and the losses become substantial. Again, a lesson learned in Latin America and Asia. And uh, unfortunately, uh, in the case of Europe, uh, it's getting on to two years since this crisis began. Uh, and what happens, talking about the banking system, when you have a sovereign in trouble, it drags in its banks. And when the banking system is in trouble, like it was in Ireland, it drags in the sovereign. So really what we have in Europe, we have problems with the banks and the sovereigns. And I think that that brings me to the, the final point here, which is the private sector. One of the things I uh, argued for was getting the private sector involved early on in Europe, because the private sector, at least at the beginning of this crisis, held most of the debt. And if you're going to get yourself out of a crisis, again, we learned in Latin America and Asia, you've got to get back to the markets. And uh, how do you get back to the markets? Uh, the private sector has to take you there. And how are you going to get there? You can't just do it on austerity measures. They're very necessary, as my colleagues have mentioned. But you've got to show a population that there's growth at the end of the tunnel. You can't just have austerity, austerity, austerity. You've got to show that there's growth, which is why the Brady Plan was a success uh, in Latin America and other areas because it showed growth uh, at the end, I, I think, of, uh, of the cycle. Uh, my Belgian colleague had mentioned steps that were necessary. They've got to move on a fiscal union. Uh, they've violated uh, Maastricht uh, and the price, you know, and the stability and growth pact almost immediately, which is a terrible example for the other countries. Uh, and you can't have a monetary union without some sort of physical count counterpart. No one's talked about my own country, the United States, which has a lot of problems. Victor asked me to comment on this before the session began. We're in a period of what I, what I call stagnation. I'd say Europe's there too, where you have minimal growth, 1% or less, and you don't create jobs with that type of growth. And so we have a deficit problem in the United States, witnessed S&P's action downgrading the U.S., uh, but we also have a jobs uh, and growth problem. And we have the structure, which Europe does not have, to solve it. The question is, do the United States have the will to do it? And I think this uh, so-called super commission, what was put together in Congress, has to come up with some recommendations on cutting back on the deficit. If not, there are automatic cuts built in. I think at the end of the day that'll happen. President Obama announced a new a stimulus program. I don't think he's got to get it all through. He'll get parts of it through. But all of these things have to take place, and there's a sense of urgency and timing. And nobody here in this group has mentioned the G20. The G20 was supposed to replace the G7. Uh, it was supposed to have, as its prime target, sustained growth. And we haven't seen much out of the uh, G7. I was in uh, Korea with that meeting last November and nothing happened. Now we have one in France in November. And I think the G7 has to agree on implementation of a lot of these policies because we're in an interlinked world today. You can't have a one-off situation because the world is too small. Markets move in nanoseconds. So there has to be some understanding and coordination and cooperation, which was mentioned by uh, Premier Wen Jiabao this morning, on a number of issues, whether it be regulation, currency wars, trade, etc. But the banks are key, and you can't overload the banks with too much regulation. They have to raise capital. European banks, a number of them have to. We had tough stress tests 
that the U.S. Treasury and the regulators put on the U.S. banks two years ago, and it worked. Substantial amounts of capital were raised. We all know what happened with the first stress tests in Europe. All the Irish banks were passed. Uh, most of the cajas, the savings in, in, in uh, Spain were passed, and a number of the uh, Landis banks who then had to go back and recapitalize uh, in Germany. So I think uh, we are fortunate that we had st uh, a tough stress testing. And I think uh, Zhu Min and the IMF have taken, Lagarde, have taken a stand that you need to move ahead and raise capital. Uh, but in, in addition to raising capital, uh, it is very important that the politicians put forth a structure that can function in Europe and into the United States, that the politicians move on both the deficit and jobs and growth. Because otherwise, we're going to have real problems. And let me tell you, my friends from Asia, uh, our economies are so interlinked that, uh, you know, Asia and other areas of the world can't stay out of it. So we're in this thing together, and we've got to work it out together. And we have an IMF World Bank meeting coming up in less than two weeks, and I think these are going to be the prime issues on the table. Thank you, Bill. Uh, now, as I said before, you have been through many of these crises as an advising banker. If you were to be in on the call with Mrs. Merkel, Mr. Sarkozy, and Mr. Papandreou, what would be the two action steps which you would recommend to them, things to do now? I think, first of all, nothing's going to happen in Greece on the positive side unless the Greek government is prepared and able to carry forth the program that they agreed to on the 21st of July. Because you, you can put all the funding you want in there, but they have to move ahead on tax collections, privatizations, and austerity alone won't do it. You have to have income, and you have to show a path to growth. I think at the same time, I think uh, the Europeans have got to take a look again uh, in the Troika, which the IMF is part, uh, the European Central Bank and the EU, as to whether the interest rates and the, uh, uh, and, and the loan maturities are sufficient to help Greece out. But at the end of the day, Greece has got to do its part, and it's got to implement the program. And if it doesn't implement it, then you're going to have to take additional measures, and uh, what you end up doing is what are you going to do with the debt? Are you going to have debt forgiveness? Uh, what, how are you going to handle it? Are you going to put a Marshall Plan in there? Uh, are, you going to exp uh, are you going to push Greece out? What's going to happen? So the key here is the ability of this government in Greece to implement the program that it has agreed upon and to get the proper support from Europe. In, uh, in a few minutes, we may talk about other countries. Uh, let me first turn to the audience to see whether there are very brief questions from any of you. If so, please raise your hand. You'll get a microphone. Identify yourself. Only questions, I'm afraid. No statements. Though they will be very interesting, those statements. Who? Gentleman up there. Uh, I'm a journalist from Xinhua News Agency, and I would like to ask a question to Mr. Zhu Min. Just now, you've mentioned the danger of a double dip. You said there's the possibility of a double dip in the world economy. But with the prospects for further quantitative easing in the US, what is the likely prospect going to be for China and other emergent, emerging economies? What new concerns or impacts will there be for economies like us? Now, Wen Jiabao has talked of the need for a healthy and stable monetary policy. This is a change of direction. If we talk about improving the quality and model of Chinese economic growth, then what are we to do? Thank you very much for your question. Um, I'm sorry, I will reply in Chinese. I might as well reply in Chinese to a question in Chinese. Well, it's certainly not a trivial question that you've raised. And Mr. Singer has answered part of it already. Will excessive volatility in the continent of Europe affect China and other emerging economies? It's a very interesting question. 
issue, the potential spread, signs of a potential spread across the world. There's much greater volatility in Europe, but so far there's a disconnect between volatility there and in Asia. Now, what used to happen is a little risk, a little bit of volatility in Europe or the US would cause tenfold, hundredfold volatility in Asia. This time it's different. This time it's the opposite. For the first time in 50 years, volatility and crises in developed economies are having a negative impact on developing and emerging economies, but it's a much more limited impact. Now, that is interesting, but there is no reason for the emerging economies to think that they're isolated from this. Several reasons for that. Firstly, the world's economy is at a particularly interesting position of low interest rates and high volatility. This is quite unusual. There's higher volatility than prior to 07 and 08. So at the moment, it's low rates around the world, which means that there's a lot of capital flows going around the world, which will cause difficulties for attempts at deleveraging. Now, related to that point number two, as of last year, less developed and emerging economies accounted for 47.8 percent of the world economy in PPP terms, but in financial terms, they only accounted for 19 percent of the world capital markets. So they will be moving in a more marketized direction, led by the capital markets. We seem to be on the cusp of a structural change in the world economy. With low rates and high levels of liquidity, there's still ample scope for repercussions in China. Now, thirdly, there is a new risk of excessive growth in loans. Growth in GDP compared to growth in loans was generally less than 100% prior to the crisis, whereas in China it was 200%. In Turkey it's 420% at the moment. So there's a new round of loan growth to a large extent driven by governments attempting to spark off economic growth, but at a time of a drop in economic growth, this growth in loans is a large potential risk given the potential problems of quality of these loans. So what we need in the developed world is decisive action against a potential crisis by governments. In the developing world, we need strong measures to prevent a potential future crisis. So a whole new set of issues almost, uh, very important ones. Uh, Victor Chu, would you like to, uh, to react to this? Because it, it, it did raise a few very important issues which you are immediately uh, involved with. And we can also can, can, uh, understand the yes, that helps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think the um, if we are we could be um, in the midst of a much bigger problem. Yes. You know, if uh, if strong clinical uh, reforms are not you know put in place fairly soon. Now, unfortunately, uh, what Bill says is interesting because the, the political process and the institutional process cannot react 
in, um, in crisis management, the way the private sector is able to. You know, that's, that's also a, a, a difficult situation. Right? I think out of all that, the one, one um, interesting process is the internationalization of the RMB. You know, from an investor's point of view, from a saver's point of view, um, people now have a chance to invest in offshore RMB deposit. Because where you have the yen, the uh, dollar, and the euro, the three major currency, all you know, going through extreme volatility, uh, the, saven, the, the haven actually is now this international offshore RMB deposit. You know, that's for people on the street. You can now go to, go to uh, uh, Bank of China, New York, and Washington and change US dollar. Uh, for RMB, and at least you can, in a limited way, you can, you can, you can, you can uh, protect your savings, and hopefully, in the long, longer term, that could also give um, governments uh, another alternative in in putting uh, their their reserve portfolio. Thank so. you very much. Um, before I ask one or two more questions to the panel, let me see in the room who would like to raise a question. Yes, there's a lady here in row four. And a lady in the back, on third row from the back. Uh, uh, Thank you very much. I'd like to ask uh, a question to Jumin. I'm from the Economic Observer. If we take the background, which is low growth in Europe and the US, second half of last year, and the possibility of a double dip. What factors do you think will be available to drive future growth? Because I can speak Chinese, this is why I get so many questions in the economy issue. Well, okay. But th there's some relationship. Also because you're uh, now a, a deputy managing director of the International Monetary Fund, you mean? No, 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 no. That, that's not the case. That's not the case. This gave you time to reflect on the answer, but we really all <laughs> died to hear it. Everybody's concerned about whether we're going to have a double dip. Personally, I do not believe so. Global economy is slowing down, especially the overall developed economies. It's declining, slowing down very rapidly. For example, the U.S. economy from the expected 3 percent GDP growth to a mere 1.5, 1.8 percent. So people may have different forecasts, but the, you know, very fast declining. At the same time, the emerging markets growth rate is also being slowing down for India, for China, etc., etc. But the economy is still growing, but at a slower pace. Right now, the overall economy has now been tremendously impacted in a structural way. Based on the standard, if one economy for two quarters in a row have a negative growth, we call that a entry into recession. But right now, even for the developed economy, they do not have the two uh, quarters in a row negative growth. So this is why we do not believe we're going to have to see the double dip. There are one precondition. Right now, we are indeed in a very key moment, an urgent period in the crisis. If the government fails to adopt decisive, effective measures, it's still possible for us to slide into recession. So this is a very important point. The main demand is two things, twofold. The new emerging economy and developing the economy need to stimulate their internal domestic consumption. Developed economy will also need through traditional physical stimulation demand to private consumption to investment. So to change, uh, transform this process before the global economy can enjoy a global uh, balanced uh, uh, momentum or motive force of growth. I would, Thank you. Bill, yes. I would just uh, add to that by a couple of things. First of all, nobody's mentioned Japan here, world's yeah. third largest economy. We've talked about Europe, we've talked about China, we've talked about India, the United States. But uh, I think it's very important to understand that uh, uh, Japan has its growth problems also, which I think is adding <clears throat> uh, to the problem. Uh, Xumin has talked about the question of uh, a number of the emerging market economies, so is uh, 
uh, uh, Minister Singh. And I think uh, it's very important that we, we talk about inflation here too, which uh, has impacted a number of the emerging markets because uh, what we're seeing is uh, inflation in both food and energy. Oil is still over $80 a barrel. Uh, we've seen food inflation here. <clears throat> uh, even in the United States, food is, uh, uh, prices have increased over 4%, which is a lot for the U.S. And so I think it is a very sensitive, difficult period because uh, the so-called, I say so-called mature economies uh, need to basically uh, work on both deficits and jobs and growth. But in the emerging markets, they've got to be very careful on the inflationary side and, as been pointed out uh, by Zhu Min and others here, uh, they've got to be very careful <clears throat> on the uh, over-leveraging. This is why I go back to the importance of this meeting of the G20, which we're going to see uh, in Cannes. So you get all sides together and decide how, is, how are we going to uh, work on sustained growth without getting into currency wars. We just saw the Swiss peg there, currency to the euro, uh, and trade wars and regulatory arbitrage on the uh, regulatory side. So all these things are building up to the IMF World Bank meetings and the meeting of the G20 in, in Cannes. And I think these are decisive moments for where the world economy is going to go. So timing is of the essence that the steps all of us are talking about in this panel are really taken and taken fairly rapidly. Bill, given the uncertainty which is now very widely spread and the worries and the threats, would it have been rational to bring the G20 meeting forward from November to the time of the Washington meetings in two weeks? What is the use of doing this in two steps while there's every day major, major concern among the electorates, among people who have jobs or who don't have jobs, among banks, among markets? I mean, what is this? Why, why no, I, I think you're absolutely correct. And substituting a finance minister's meeting for a heads of state meeting doesn't work because the ultimate authority is with the heads of state, and you're absolutely correct. Why wait <clears throat> until November to do it? It should be brought ahead because we learned that in 2008. <clears throat> Everything was just behind time. We talk about in the automobile business just in time yeah. production, but what we're dealing with with the politicians here is just behind time. So I think you're absolutely correct. And if we're going to make a recommendation of this panel, I for one would back your suggestion. We ought to move it ahead. And <clears throat> instead of having the finance ministers and central bank heads together in two weeks in Washington, the IMF World Bank meetings, we should do something with the heads of state because they have the ultimate, uh, the ultimate power along with parliaments to take these decisions, not the finance ministers and the central bank heads. Minister Singh. Uh, can I uh, add to uh, your question, Bill, by asking you two things which uh, have been discussed widely, certainly in India. Namely, has G20 run out of steam? I mean, in a sense, G20, two years ago, when it began to address this crisis, left some of the important structural issues which needed to be addressed uh, unanswered. I think part of the reason why we began this discussion was that the first crisis is lingering, and the G20 in recent months seems to be flagging and run out of steam. So how does it invest new leadership in the G20 decision-making process? Well, I would say, first of all... Very, very uh, the, briefly, Bill. Yeah, I said, first of all, the only meeting that I saw that really produced anything at the G20 was a London meeting, where you were in the depth of the crisis, uh, right. at, uh, you know, the Great Recession. And I think they have the ability to do so, and the time to act is now. That's why I say get them together. You have all the questions, growth, uh, regulation, uh, you know, uh, exchange rates, uh, trade, that really need to be spoken to. And if the G20 can't come up with some solutions, then you've got to wonder if they're going to go to the way of the G7, which doesn't seem to do much either. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Jumin, I would almost ask you about this, given your past. Uh, is that appropriate? About the G20? Oh, G20. Yeah, I think uh, G20, uh, currently, the global <coughs> cooperation, obviously, yeah. is the most important issue. Yes because uh, the cross is more expanded to all these different areas. So we're very much looking forward that the G20 can play a key role and uh, then bring the party together and find the real solution. Uh, but they also uh, agree with you for the short term, 
because the concerns on the growth, concerns on the job, concerns on the market volatilities are the key issue today. And I hope you will come up with some real solution for those issues. Thank you. There was a question in the back, fourth row from the back, I believe, a lady. And then in the middle over there, also in the back. Hi, I'm Michelle Walker with the World Policy Institute. I'm a young global leader. Uh, Mr. Chu and Mr. Rhodes both refer referenced very briefly the regulatory changes that are, are coming and in the air. Uh, at the beginning of the crisis, there was a lot of talk about international coordination on, on super supervision, regulation, standards. We haven't heard as much recently. I'd like your thoughts on where specifically the most international cooperation is needed and what you think the most important changes are that need to happen. Okay. I, I will ask I, the panel you to, me to react, to that. Yeah. You want me to we'll react to that in the final <clears throat> round because we have about 10 minutes left. We'll go a little over time. There's another session in this same room. So I'm collecting brief questions in the back there. Uh, Ah, well, yes. thank you. Um, from China Daily, well, one question is to go to Mr. Zhu. Well, as you mentioned earlier, that um, the emerging, I mean, emerging economies should take measures timely to prevent uh, potential risks, and because their growth is largely driven by the, glow, uh, the long growth. So, what kind of measure, uh, what, what kind of suggestions you can offer, especially for China? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, question on the front row. Alessandro Magnoli Bocchi, Quick China Investment Company. A quick question, if I understand, the panel is kind of agreeing on uh, um, a muddle through scenario. Uh, I just want to understand if that's what you have in mind. Uh, or another way of asking the question is, in two years when the dust settles, what world will we have, right? We'll have? We will have seen disorderly adjustments. We'll have more currencies. Uh, or is it muddle through? And how do you see the situation evolving? Thank you. Um, but you want to make a quick <coughs> response to that? Yes. You, you, you more questions? Or? Yeah, I, I would like okay, to take I'll two more back. questions and then come, come back. back to each of you. There was a lady in the back in the middle and a gentleman in the back. No, no. First, lady here in the middle, then a gentleman all the way in the back. It's a white shirt. And then there was a, if everyone is very brief, he can squeeze okay. in a few more questions. A question for Zhu Ming. Today, ADP uh, uh, you know, adjusted downward its focus about Asia, including China economy uh, growth, uh, because it doesn't believe uh, the situation is very okay. And in this circumstances, because China being a uh, a very important engine for global economic recovery, will that uh, affect the global economy? Uh, some people just mentioned the exchange rate uh, fluctuation because China adopts a uh, kind of a fixed uh, uh, exchange rate policy. So what will be the future scenario? Thank you. Hello. One, each one question. Gentleman yes. in the back Hello. and then gentleman over there. Yes, gentleman in white shirt and then bluish shirt. Yes. Yeah, it's me. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Another question for Mr. Zhu Mi. Uh, today, Premier Wen Jiabao at the forum talk about his question only. Oh, Does China need to purchase the treasuries in Europe? Do you think this is a good timing for China to do that? Short, what can the BRICS as an organization do to save the world economy? <clears throat> Thank you. As the author of the BRICS would say, it's not an organization. It's yeah, just... I mean, as a group of countries then, as okay. a group. The panel... Because they have a meeting next week in Washington, I heard. Yeah, Thank you. The panel will react to that. One final question. Gentleman here, right in the middle, white shirt. Question only, please. What happens if um, Greece can't actually meet the terms of the bailout? Question mark. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh,
I'm returning to the panel. Everyone <laughs> has two and a half minutes. Uh, we will uh, go in, uh, in reverse order from the start. So um, uh, we will uh, start with Bill Rhodes. Do you want us to, to answer any of those questions? <laughs> well, yes, uh, you, could okay. raise, you could raise other questions, Bill, but, no, I, but I, I would just take the one which I think is very important, Good, sure. which yeah. is on the regulatory uh, situation, because we came out of this great recession and there were all sorts of uh, <clears throat> promises made uh, by G20 countries, Group of Seven, uh, about uh, the need for cooperation, coordination in, uh, you know, in capital requirements, uh, and other measures to strengthen the, uh, the world financial system. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, every, not every country, but a lot of countries seem to be going their own route because we, had, we have an agreement with Basel, the Basel Committee called Basel III, but then uh, the head of the Basel Committee says these are minimal standards and every country is free to add on if they want. And so what we're getting is we're getting uh, different plans in different countries to how to implement uh, Basel III, and we're in an interlinked world, as I said earlier, and that goes for the, uh, uh, the financial system and the banking system. And so if we're not careful and we don't really have an equal playing field, we're going to get regulatory arbitrage where the country with the least amount of capital requirements and regulation is where <clears throat> a lot of institutions will go, and you're going to have more shadow banking, which is uncontrolled by the regulators than we had before. So I think one of the urgent points now is that needs to be taken up by Basel and the Financial Stability Board and the G20 is to get back to the promise that they made that we were going to get international cooperation and coordination in the implementation of these new capital rules. And one of the things we have to keep in mind is uh, we do need uh, increased capital uh, in the banking system and in the financial system in general, without a doubt. But you can't overburden some of these institutions because then you won't get the lending you need, particularly in the so-called, I say so-called again, mature markets because then you're not going to get the growth. So this is a very, very important subject. I'm glad you asked the question. Thank you, uh, uh, Bill. Uh, Victor Chu. I think in terms of the reform of the financial architecture, a lot of progress has been made. But you need a lot of harmonization too, because of course different countries have their own different requirements and, and, uh, and, uh, and needs. Um, different countries too have looked at their own internal system. For example, in, in Great Britain, um, the Vickers report has just been published that are um, quite uh, uh, radical in terms of uh, suggestions of ring fencing, of uh, investment banking and proprietary trading activities from the core uh, banking and retail banking operations. So you see a lot, a lot of progress has already been made, a lot of thinking has already been made, but obviously in terms of international harmonized agreed structure that's yet to come. In terms of the uh, sovereign debt crisis, um, the difficulty is we all know more or less what needs to be done. Uh, Greece needs to observe the agreement and get on with it. And we also know um, uh, what kind of responsible action that different uh, parts of the world need to do in order to, to come back, to, to recover. But the political process of many of these countries make it very difficult to deliver uh, those reforms. I mean, that's the worry. And that's why the question from the, the gentleman here to say, what if Greece does not uh, uh, deliver? Uh, now, in, so far, we have muddled through. But now I think we come to a, a time that there's no more muddle through. We are facing the, um, the ultimate. Now, my hunch is that Greece cannot deliver. Um, and if it, it, it deliver, the first part, it something will happen down the road, because domestically it was not, it's not politically acceptable. So the, 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 that's what, where I think we have, to, we have to think the unthinkable, and, and uh, we hope for the best, but prepare, prepare for the worst. Thank you, Victor. And Kaysing. Well, I have just a couple of very brief comments to make. First, uh, that I entirely agree with the general sense that Emerging markets cannot isolate themselves and remain unaffected. 
by the global contagion effect, no matter what we do. So I think that the, in the interest of emerging markets, an orderly adjustment process uh, in, the, in the very near term is, is exceedingly relevant. I'll not make any comment on the European situation because I entirely agree that perhaps a monetary union without a fiscal union and more than a fiscal union in terms of uh, coordinated action on other fronts perhaps may be therefore something which may or may not work. What can the BRICS do together uh, to be able to ameliorate the crisis? I think that that's an important question, but the BRICS must act as a cohesive group to influence the decision making in the G20 so that we are continued access to global capital on cost which is affordable and the fact that access to markets do not get blocked by the growing fear of a protectionist influence, these I believe are fundamental to ensure that, that direct foreign investment and growth rates in these countries are kept at a robust pace. And finally, I just take one point. The most important worry, Victor, which is for a country like India, and perhaps I would say China, is how does one contain, and more than contain, how does one anchor inflationary expectations in a manner that the growth in the short run doesn't get compromised? This is not very easy for us to find an answer. Where does the balancing act take place that we do not kill the growth process by the, uh, by the central bank tightening up its process? It did it 11 times in 10 months as far as India is concerned, which has hurt investment sentiments very much. How does one contain the genie of inflation which is out and anchor inflationary expectations in a credible way which sustains the robust growth process? Thank you, Victor. Vincent, I'm sorry. Yeah. I particularly like the question of the YGL. I'm, I'm also a YGL and we had sessions on Monday and Tuesday on, on economic growth and, and the quality of growth. I think that what bankers thought was, the, was an incident in 2008, I think is a, a crisis also of values. Mm -hmm. And it's important that we bring back values in our economic system. Uh, Klaus Schwab this morning talked about uh, the importance of the quality of growth instead of quantity of growth. You should read a book. There's an interesting book, a small book called The Great Stagnation, written by an American. It's, I think it's one of the best books of this year. And uh, it has to do with the fact that uh, we've consumed in the West the so-called low-hanging fruits of what we have. That's education, land, and so on. So we should look at, at other forms of, of, of growth, the quality of growth that's for the, for the West. Secondly, I would like to say something on, on Greece, the question of Greece. Um, um, I saw that Victor was a little bit, uh, uh, he said, okay, but we should act now. The reason why, as a young European politician, talk about long-term sustainable solutions is because we have a lack of leadership in Europe. If you have three or four or five presidents in Europe, how can you imagine that you find a solution to a crisis? Therefore, Victor, even if what I've been talking about, the Eurobonds, and the solution of the European Finance Minister is a solution on long term. The gentleman talked about two years. It is something that we should, be, should, should have done two or three years ago. So the point that I make is that if you think that with short term measures we can solve this issue, we're not in for a quick fix. I'm sorry. Probably next year we will back here and discuss this. But if European politicians do not act now, we'll continue to have a problem for decades and that our children will pay. Thank you, Vincent. Um, I think Bill. Yeah, just a quick two, two point that I quick. would add on what Victor had asked me earlier on, on what ought to happen in Europe. One of the things in, that I mention again and again in my book, uh, Banker to the World, talking about all of these crises, is when heads of state uh, make pronouncements like we saw on July 21st uh, in Europe, they have to set a timetable on when they are going to be able to implement. And one of the things that has been spooking the markets is we have the heads of state, uh, the heads of the European Union in Brussels, and a number of central bankers and ministers of finance get up and talk about we're going to do this and that. They do not put a timetable on it, and they do not say in what stages they're going to implement it. So when the market sees that, it kills the credibility, and therefore you wonder why the markets are moving the way they do. It's, it's basically things we've learned over and over again, but uh, unfortunately Europe 
is forcing itself to relearn it, and it's going to be a very costly process. Thank you, Bill. Uh, finally, zoom in. Well, thank I mean, you. There are three scenarios, I believe, right? Yeah, it's, it's the good, the bad, or the ugly. Good Which one is it? Yeah. Well, I think I will between three. The first question is about the murdering three. Uh, through the question is absolutely no. I think in the past two years, as Bill mentioned, as our Vincent mentioned, we observe and the politicians try to murder through all those issues, uh, but at this moment, as Vic mentioned, room is zero. Uh, I don't think there's any room for the politician to murder through the current situations. You have to take decisive action today. Otherwise, we run into the crisis. I think it's become ever clear. Go back to the question for the regulatory frame reform. I think it's a very good question so when crisis come out, so the reform becomes the main issue, but unfortunately, the sovereign debt crisis come up that overshadow uh, uh, the regulatory framework. So I would say regulatory framework uh, 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 really uh, achieved a lot of uh, uh, progress, uh, as Bill mentioned, the Basel III capital ratio, Baba. But there are still key issues un uh, unfinished, as you mentioned, particularly with international cooperation. Number one, the regulatory framework uh, over the across-board capital flow. We still don't have solution on that one yet. Number two, for the cross-board, uh, the resolution uh, 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 framework, because today, with the interconnectedness, we all link together. So if someone, some financial institutions get into the problem, the, all the others will, will get in together. But we don't have a cross-board resolution framework, in particular, this is very important for Europe today. Uh, if we don't have that one, it's very difficult to do the capital injection. So it's the number three, another controversial issue is whether we should financial uh, transaction uh, taxation. There's a lot of debating about that, a lot of support, a lot of disagreements, but I think it's obvious it's, uh, it's important issues. We, we need to continue to do that. I think this is a fundamental issue, so we need to push the regulatory reform further to so finish this very important issue. Uh, I think that's the issue. Uh, the question for the policy for the emerging market to prevent the, the risk and the potential crisis situations that we mentioned. I think a few things are absolutely important for emerging market. I agree with Mr. Singh said, regardless of what the emerging market do, you will have the continued impact, impact by the advanced economy. But I disagree with Mr. Singh. Uh, it says, uh, in the sense that we can do a lot of things to reduce the damage. I think that's a lot that's of room. That's true. Yeah, as that's, I say, that's the beta true. risk today is much, much smaller than, say, three years ago. That's true. So it's obvious to show that the world is very different. The few things, number one, continuously tight monetary policy. Because emerging market has also have the loose monetary policy uh, over the credit issues, continue tight monetary policy to, to, to combat the inflation pressures and also to slow down the loan growth to make sure the banking sector is safe and stable. This is always the most important issues because in the emerging market, banking sector always plays such a key important role overall the capital market and the bonds market. So make sure the banking sector is okay is very important. And the second issue is also gradually neutralize the physical policy. At this moment, it's not a time to stimulate the, uh, the, the growth further, rather and try to stabilize the whole thing. I think this is a uh, 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 very important uh, issues. And uh, I think this is the few macro policies emerging market need to prepare and build a cushion, uh, particularly in the f uh, fiscal area. Because in the fiscal area, the fiscal space, most of them are gone in the past three years for emerging market. So it's time to rebuild the fiscal space to prepare for the, 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 the potential uh, crisis wells. The four two Chinese questions, let me trans, trans to Chinese questions. Uh, yes, it's going to confuse people if I switch between languages, but I will answer in Chinese. On the ADB's downgrade of growth forecasts for Asia, this is a good thing. And it would be healthy for Asian and emerging market growth to slow down. This is part of government efforts to gradually cool down growth in an effort to provide greater stability 
But there's one issue for concern, which is that when there's a rather brisk slowdown globally, you need to make sure that your own economy doesn't slow down too fast. This requires an enormous amount of political caution when making decisions. Now, I was asked, is it the right time for China to buy European bonds? Are you trading bonds at the moment? Well, you shouldn't be framing the question like that, clearly. What we need is the whole world working hand in hand to head off the sovereign debt crisis and financial instability which are leading to the crisis in the developed world. Premier Wen reiterated this point very well this morning. The Chinese government has always been in favor of international financial stability and it was important that he reiterated it this morning. Uh, first of all, an apology in closing to all of you for being so harsh on the discipline of our timing. Many thanks for it to the panel for an absolutely spectacular, fascinating conversation. And I think the conclusion is because somebody asked whether we would draw conclusions. Well, the forum doesn't draw conclusions, not even about the G20 uh, bill. But I believe that everyone comes away with a, uh, a sense that muddling through is no longer possible, that there is a sense of huge urgency, and that uh, life seems to be very uncertain, rather uncharted, and possibly unsettling. Have a very nice evening. Thanks.